Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is John Rosewell. I'm uh, joining you from the um, I'm going to talk about the general issue of quality assurance in uh, MOOCs. I'm going to start with some very general remarks about uh, quality. Think about e-learning a little bit more generally, then talk more specifically about MOOCs. And all the way through, I'm going to try and focus on the design aspects of it, particularly. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure that I am seeing quite the right thing at the moment. So uh, just apologies just for a minute. It's, I missed. You see your presentation, John? Well, John is gone. John, are you still there? Well, oh, something went wrong there. Apologies for that. Let's see if he's coming back to us. Okay. Hello, John. Are you back? Uh, I think so. <laughs> Am I back? Uh, we see you again. Right. So that's that's a, that's good. Okay. That's good. Um, I'm, so I'm not sure at which point I uh, I left you, uh, but I had just introduced myself and uh, hadn't gone on to anything important yet. So let's take it. I've uh, introduced myself. Hello. Uh, so let me dive straight in and uh, move on to the next slide. Um, both to standard core offerings of, of higher education, but to some extent for MOOCs as well. Um, so we need to keep both of them in mind. And of course, if you're involved in producing a MOOC, then you're a teacher and presumably you want to produce a good MOOC. We're all teachers, we want to do things well. Um, so there's always an aspect of quality enhancement, and that can be a major focus for why we bother with uh, quality assurance. I just mentioned institutional mission there because it really does depend on why you're producing a MOOC, uh, what you're trying to get out of it, what sort of things you might be guided towards doing. And so the circumstance in which you produce a MOOC uh, is very important. Um, and so particularly if you're thinking of a MOOC as being uh, open to uh, non-traditional learners, you might be very interested in the learning gain that those students uh, make, uh, even if they don't necessarily uh, come out with qualifications or something. So looking at uh, the benefit that uh, a MOOC can make to an individual student is important, but that does mean uh, needing to know how you define that benefit. Okay, let's move on. Um, there are lots of different approaches to quality assurance in, uh, in e-learning. 
Um, and this slide lists some of the, the issues to think about, uh, whether your focus is on compliance or enhancement, whether you look at the process uh, of the product. Um, it, particularly, can we predict the quality of the course before you built it by looking at the pedagogical model? Or do we wait and see what happens? In other words, look at how many students completed, uh, passed the course, or, or something like that. So that's focusing on an outcome or the input. And generally, I think the literature seems to suggest that really the best way, particularly if you're looking at uh, enhancement, is to take a very holistic view, to look at uh, the whole picture, and to include process and context as well as the product. In other words, it's no good just looking at the final uh, product. You need to be in there much earlier on and look at the way the course is produced and the context in which it's been produced. Um, there are a number of uh, models for quality assurance out there. And this review by Ebba, uh, Keith Williams and others, I think Ebba I noticed in the list of participants, and so she's here today, is a, a review of many of those models. And one thing that comes out is that uh, there is quite a good deal of consensus amongst uh, the commonly used frameworks. All of them did take this rather holistic view of what's going on, uh, which you can either divide up into three large groups, services, products, and management, or probably about six uh, more detailed ones. Um, and these in do include a very wide range of aspects. And so course design, for example, uh, which is what you might be thinking of when you're thinking about the design of MOOCs, is only one of those six uh, components, or areas to look at. Um, and so th that tends to lead towards uh, the idea that you shouldn't be approaching quality by thinking about a scorecard in which you just look at the final product. Um, and uh, I just want to make a, a connection to the European Standards and Guidelines, which uh, will cover quality assurance across Europe. Um, two aspects of this. One is that actually there's quite a good fit to that model that I showed from Eva, with the six areas that she singled out uh, mapping quite well to the first uh, six of the ESG uh, list of things. Now, ESG uh, really applies to accredited learning and not necessarily to MOOCs. Um, but I think the general area of quality assurance agencies are taking more and more of an interest in MOOCs. And so I think uh, we should be thinking about MOOC quality in uh, the light of um, arrangements like the ESG. And particularly, uh, there have been some recent publication, uh, which is about specifically the QA of e-learning, not necessarily MOOCs, but e-learning more generally, uh, which supplements the ESG uh, with some additional guidance and indicators. So let me move on again. And, and ask you for the first poll, which is whether or not you use a, a, a QA process or framework. So uh, if you'd like to take a moment to click on that and fill it in, uh, we'll have a look to see uh, when we get some results uh, coming in from that. Um, uh, Lizzie, uh, can I leave it to you to flip us back uh, when we're finished? Or do I need to vote as well? Yes, of course. Thank you. OK, can we see some results? Yes. 18, 19. Okay, I'm sure that would be enough to see something interesting. Okay, so uh, oh, the majority seems to be uh, for no, um, that people aren't using uh, any QA process. 
some people are using an internally defined one and uh, a few people using something that's externally defined. Now, I didn't actually make clear the question whether we were talking about uh, MOOCs specifically or e-learning or uh, just general um, HE. Uh, so I probably should have been clear before I asked the question. My apologies about that. Um, but interesting that uh, people aren't using some uh, a, a well-established framework. Um, let me go back to my slides and carry on. Um, so the next question is, uh, would you do more um, uh, quality assurance activity? And again, let, let's take it very broadly and say, forget about whether it's MOOCs or a core offering from a university. Uh, but why would you want to do more quality insurance? <coughs> there are a list of things there that you might want to, uh, to show. So please do uh, fill that one in. Okay, so I want to improve my teaching. That's a that's a great answer, isn't it? So clearly, people, if they're interested in doing quality assurance, uh, it's because we're interested in enhancement and wanting to improve teaching, improve the offering we give to our students, which is a very comforting thing to do. Um, sometimes I feel that quality assurance is something that is imposed on people that they have to do because uh, somebody else is demanding it of them. And so it's very nice to see that people want to do it. Uh, for enhanced reasons. Um, that's great. So let me move on then uh, with slides and move on to uh, the next thing, which is to start talking about one particular framework, uh, which is e-excellence. So this is a, um, a project that's been running for, for quite a while. Um, it's now uh, provides a fairly well-established framework uh, for thinking about quality in e-learning generally and increasingly blended learning as well. Uh, so there's a link to the website. There are plenty of resources on there. Uh, most specifically, there's the manual, which I've highlighted there, which is uh, available for download. Um, and there are a number of benchmarks. So um, the benchmarks are in the manual, but also a lot of uh, interesting and useful background, I hope. That e-excellence is organized into the six chapters, into six chapters, uh, which are the ones that uh, Ebba's report uh, picked out uh, earlier on. Um, so they start with strategic management, which is a very high level view about uh, how the institution does e-learning. And then moves into curriculum design, which is looking at e-learning across a whole program study. Course design, which is e-learning in the design of an individual course. And here we're probably thinking about 5, 10, uh, 20 ECTS uh, credit size, uh, meaning a course. Then course delivery, some more technical and practical aspects. And then very importantly, the areas of support. Support and training provided to staff on the one hand, and information provided information, advice, and guidance uh, provided to students uh, as well. So students support a very important uh, component of success in e-learning. Um, I mentioned benchmarks. And here's a, a sample uh, benchmark. Uh, I've picked one here, which is about learning outcomes. Um, and, and actually, this is from the most recent edition of the essence manual and you can see there is uh, a fairly strong mention of blended learning um, and the basic idea behind here is something that you, you may have come across as constructive alignment is making sure that uh, methods of assessment and uh, teaching are aligned to the learning outcomes each benchmark is uh, supported with a number of more detailed sample indicators. So these are just 
uh, I've picked a couple of examples here, but even so, indicators are only ever um, suggestions. They're examples of, of the sorts of things that an institution might do. So a benchmark is a statement of what a good institution will be doing in some form, but it's very generic. It doesn't give detail about how they might do it. And the indicators give a little bit more detail on picket. But it may be that in your particular context, you do something in a completely different way. So they're only ever indicative. It's not a checklist approach. So it doesn't mean that you have to do exactly what's on screen. Uh, but these are the sorts of things that a reviewer might look for, uh, expect, ask about. And they're in two levels. The one would be um, a basic indicator for most uh, institutions working uh, effectively. Um, but then there's probably some that you could pick out as being really excellent practice. Um, <clears throat> so just a little bit more about the benchmarking as an approach. Uh, it is intended to be a quality enhancement tool. It sets out a statement of best practice with the indicators I mentioned. But in any particular institution, you would need to go and collect particular evidence that you meet uh, a benchmark. And that could be very specific to a different university, to a different context, a different mission, and so on. And that allows you to identify weaknesses and strengths in your offering. Uh, and that should then lead to a roadmap of actions for improvement, so which is the quality enhancement aspect of the whole process. So the uh, outcome should always be some sort of roadmap of what am I going to do differently next time? How are they, am I going to improve the offering? So given that I mentioned that every benchmark needs to be supported by evidence, if you're actually going to use this as a sort of approach, uh, we'll have another question of who you think is best placed to provide that evidence. So uh, would it be a, the course author? Uh, should it be an administrator? Should it be the students? Uh, should you bring in an external reviewer? Um, or actually, do you need a whole team of people to do it? Um, over to you to uh, have some suggestions about who you think would be best placed to understand uh, the context and the detail of a, of a module. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, OK, it's a slightly loaded question, I think, uh, because I think rightly people have picked out the course author as the person who really understands uh, what the content is and how it's done. Um, but that, of course, puts a burden on them to do this. And so sometimes uh, it's quite good to have an administrator or somebody to do it. Getting a student voice or a student perspective in is very important. And at some point, you might want an external uh, reviewer to look at it. But probably the answer is always, actually, to do it well, you really need a team of people to do it. You need to bring in the different stakeholders who are involved in producing the course. And actually, sometimes doing that is actually really useful in itself, because it's a really good opportunity to get people together who've worked on a course uh, to think about it. Um, and quite often, you get some interesting things that come out of that discussion because people are, tend to be a little bit siloed when they're producing a course. It's a great opportunity to uh, bring things together. I'll go back to the slides um, and move on to the next one, which will actually indicate how uh, people tend to use eXcellent, and where there are actually a number of different ways of using it. And so you can start with a very informal self-assessment using a tool which is on the website, or quick scan. Uh, which you could just do on your own um, and don't have to do anything very formal. Um, other people use it as a full internal self-assessment. And normally, that does involve uh, this team of stakeholders who have to go around and collect evidence quite systematically for all the different benchmarks that are there and produce the roadmap of improvement actions. Because of course, that is the point uh, of uh, the whole process. 
if you're lucky, you can in integrate that with an existing institutional process, which you might be having to do anyway, or you can bring the evidence of things that you're doing into the e excellence process. So the ways of combining it with existing institutional processes. And uh, the final uh, way of doing it is to add in uh, an external review. And if you do that, then that can lead to the award of the label uh, by EADTU. So that's uh, an external recognition that uh, the course is um, good. It actually should really be working at a program or institution level, so something quite large, um, that it is good and also has a trajectory for improvement. Uh, so it's the enhancement aspect again. Okay, so that was a more general e-learning thing, um, and I should really turn the focus now uh, to MOOCs specifically. Um, and I think the first question actually is to ask, well, why should we bother about MOOC quality in particular? And one of the reasons for that is that they're not part of normal uh, university teaching, and they're free, and so they're often rather different. Um, so it is a, a genuine question as whether we should even bother about quality. Uh, but I think there are good reasons for doing it, and there are a list of the stakeholders involved with MOOCs. And I think all of them have legitimate reasons for wanting to know about the quality, or to be reassured about the quality of a MOOC uh, before uh, either they study it, or pay for it, or work on it, and so on. So uh, I think uh, MOOC quality is important. Um, and as I did mention quality agencies, I think they'd still have a, a, well, I think they will have an increasing role in the MOOC arena as well, because they are in, set up to work on the basis on, on behalf of the uh, remaining stakeholders there. So they have a, an important role to play. Um, but I did say that, uh, that MOOCs are different from uh, normal higher education provision. And the question is, are they different from other forms of e-learning, specifically um, in higher education? And so a, a clear answer is that they tend to be much shorter, they tend to be free, they tend to have no entry requirements, they're not a, accredited. Um, but on the other hand, the university has some reputational risk associated with it. If it puts its name to a MOOC that turns out to be poor, that's a problem. Um, and there's also quite a lot of uh, evidence and, and certainly discussion about whether MOOC participants are different uh, from conventional degree uh, students. Um, and they may have different motivations, and particularly course completion may not be their goal, they might be dipping in to get something particular out of it. And I think there is a, a, a discussion to be had about that, um, and there, there certainly is talk about that. Um, I personally have quite a strong feeling that uh, MOOCs are courses, um, that it's intrinsic in the name. And so therefore, I think that actually the sorts of um, quality measures that you apply to normal higher education should be applied to, to MOOCs um, because they offer that a sense of a complete course. Um, if they didn't, uh, then they would be a book or an OER or some other sort of resource. I, I think you might have different measures of success in that uh, sphere. But I think because of the labeling of, as a course, I think we have a responsibility to look at some of the same quality things, which is very challenging because I, clearly the behavior of MOOC participants is very different from conventional students. So let's move on. Uh, and to introduce the Open Up Ed quality label, which is going to be the main uh, bit that I'm talking about for the next section. Um, and this is um, a quality label which is derived from the excellence, and so it has a good pedigree, we think. It's uh, based on the features which have been well established in e excellence, but which is designed specifically for MOOCs. And so the idea is it would be a much more lightweight process than for e-excellence review. It would be suitable for self-assessment, uh, but also uh, offer the possibility of a formal uh, label as well. There's the website there. Lizzie's, uh, I think, already put it in the chat window as well. Uh, the materials are 
all there on the website that I will be talking about. And so they're uh, available for self-assessment, informal assessment, and so on. Um, so you don't need to go through the full formal uh, label review, although the AGU, I'm sure, would be pleased if you did. Um, so some very specific things about uh, Open Up Ed uh, is it sets itself up to be a way of distinguishing uh, assessive MOOCs as being of good quality. And one aspect of that is the quality label, and another is this list of features which all Open Up Ed MOOCs are intended to display. Um, and they're very broad, uh, but there is a feeling that these are all very important to a quality learning experience. Um, so I won't go through them in detail, but uh, the list is there. Um, you'll see how they come out uh, in, as we move on a little bit. So there are these features which all courses are expected to show the majority of most of the time, um, without quantifying it too much. Um, there are also benchmarks, um, because it's based on e-excellence benchmarks, so they are derived from the e-excellence benchmark. But what we've done is to split them into two groups. So one group are institutional. So these cover the very broad, holistic view that we, I mentioned right at the beginning, things like strategic management, curriculum design, and so on like that, which are very important for setting the foundations and the context in which good quality material is produced. So they can't be ignored in, altogether, but it's a lot of work to check them. So the idea is that the institution does those and only needs to do them occasionally and probably has already done the excellence, one would hope. And so actually these things are already in the bag. You don't need to do them um, or just need to do them once off. And from then on, uh, when we're looking at individual courses, we're looking at a much more restricted range of benchmarks, just 11 of them, um, where you do need to look at them in the context of every individual MOOC. So I'm going to go on to talk only about the course specific uh, benchmarks and I'm going to show all of them. Uh, you can see they start at number 22 because the other ones are the institutional ones. Um, I've split them onto two slides. Um, I, I will very briefly go through them. Um, they start with learning outcomes. You need a clear statement for learning outcomes and that should cover both knowledge and skills. There should be this coherence between le learning outcomes, the course content, the teaching and learning strategy, um, and the assessment methods. So all of that should hang together in a way. So you're not teaching a practical subject, for example, and then assessing it in a completely different way, for example, in a written exam. That's the sort of thing that you want to avoid. Um, number 24 talks about uh, really constructivism. It's, a, it's about trying to get people away from just doing transmission uh, um, styles of pedagogy and to allow students to, uh, to do some constructing of their own learning and to be able to communicate that with others. So that um, generation part of student learning is very important. Next one, I think uncontroversial, course content should be relevant, accurate and current. Uh, that staff who write and deliver should have skills and experience to do so successfully. And then a couple of them are specific uh, to do with um, well, sort of more practical measures. Uh, so one is about open licensing, and the other is about guidelines for layout, presentation, and accessibility. Actually, these relate strongly to the institutional things. So uh, at an institutional level, the institution should have policies uh, that cover these things. And therefore, when you're producing a MOOC, it should be kind of business as usual to make sure that uh, things are produced in conformity to that policy. And so at this point, this should just be a tick box to say, yes, I've done that. And um, you know, everything's fine. OK, I'll move on. Um, the next, uh, the last few start with another aspect of course design, which is about um, making sure that there is good engagement of the student with the material. And that's a matter of interactivity. And um, particularly in the context of MOOCs, it tends to be student to content or student to student rather than student to staff because of the uh, ratios. Staff to students will be very um, 
asymmetrical on, on, a, on a MOOC as part of the scaling of a MOOC. Um, and so you need to supplement uh, that interactivity uh, with various opportunities that would allow students to get some feedback through self-assessment, through tests or peer feedback and so on. And then moving into a more another aspect of uh, assessment is uh, to make sure that there's always a balance of the two modes of assessment, formative, which helps students um, practice and prepare what they're doing, and summative end of course stuff uh, that would let you know whether or not they succeeded and let the student know whether they succeeded and get a certificate at the end of it. And assessment should be explicit, fair, valid and reliable um, and uh, there should be measures against impersonation and plagiarism. But clearly all of that needs to be set in the context of the MOOC. It's not quite the high stakes, not quite got the um, cachet uh, associated with a full accredited offering. So you might uh, approach that rather differently and not um, make such a big deal of, of uh, for example, checking identity and so on. But it's, it's an issue. And, and a final, another one that's probably not uh, controversial, which is just to make sure that course materials are regularly reviewed and updated and improved, and that should use feedback from stakeholders, which implies that you have some method for collecting that feedback. Okay, so those are the benchmarks overall. They are very general, um, and uh, are supplemented with some additional notes. Um, so uh, this is just one example I've picked. Um, and notice particularly that there are lots of cross-references back to e-excellence because many of the benchmarks relate very directly to an e-excellence benchmark and therefore into the material which is in the e-excellence manual. Um, and so there are lots of cross-references to material in the, the manual. And when necessary, we've added in a few paragraphs where there are particular developments or something that are specific more specific to MOOCs than they would be to uh, e-learning generally. So an example of digital badges would be something to be aware of. Now, if you're carrying out um, an assessment on a formal basis, then you would need to be collecting evidence. So we talked about evidence already, and for open up ed, it would be the same thing. And so you'd be expected to uh, collect together some evidence, and there's some templates provided to make that uh, possible. And at the bottom you can see there's some little boxes which you can fill in to say whether or not the benchmark's been achieved, um, not achieved at all, or partially achieved, largely achieved, or fully achieved. So a, a, a simple sort of scaling of strengths and weaknesses there. And the open up ed features come in again at this point. So when you're collecting evidence for some particular benchmark, Usually, it's also good evidence for um, the features of Open Up Ed that you're expected to show. So usually, the evidence will apply to both. And so there's a simple tick box there that would let you uh, do that at the same time. So let me move on again. Um, this is rather detailed, so you won't be able to read it. But just to run through this, uh, we have a, a quick scan that makes uh, the possibility of doing a self-assessment on a fairly informal basis rather easier and basically it's collecting everything down onto a single page so these are the uh, 11 benchmarks that apply at the course level they're all listed there um if i just go to the next one you can see over on the right hand side there is a space to put the tick boxes in about how well you think that benchmark is achieved in your particular MOOC not achieved partially, largely, or fully achieved. Um, so you can just make a tick there. And there is also space to do this mapping uh, between the benchmarks and the open up ed features. Actually, that's pretty well filled in for you anyway, because typically um, they, the things go together quite nicely. So there's an example you probably won't be able to read. Number 27, it's about course components having an open license. Um, and if you do that, you can see there's a little cross on the second column, which corresponds to digital openness. So if you've met the benchmark about uh, open licensing, 
then that actually that's good evidence that you're digitally open as well. So it, automatically the two go together. So there's really not much effort uh, involved in checking that that mapping is sensible and whether you want to add or take away uh, one or two of those crosses is probably all that you need to do. So um, that's the quick scan. Um, uh, so that was a bit of a rush through that. Um, so I thought what would be interesting now is to go on to another activity. Um, we'll have a go at this. So um, I'd like you to um, think about uh, a recent MOOC experience. It can be something that you've studied recently or uh, that you've been involved in, in doing. And just think about, I've, I've picked half a dozen of the benchmarks and just uh, make a mark uh, on that to show uh, whereabouts you think um, you fit in on that scale or the, the MOOC that you're talking about. So Lizzie, we want a whiteboard. Let me see if I've got the right one. Here we are. No, wrong one. Beg your pardon. Go again. There we are. Um, so I hope you're all looking at this whiteboard now. Uh, you can pick a different color up at the top of the screen and then uh, make a mark to uh, where you think um, you are. So please do go ahead and put in uh, as many uh, ticks as you want. Um, I'm going to also join in as well, thinking about something particularly. Um, Well, I can see lots of pencils. That's really interesting. It's all very busy. I'll just leave it a minute longer and see if anyone else wants to uh, join in on this. That's great. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for, for joining in with that. Uh, that's really quite nice. Um, so you can see quite a spread of, of uh, things there, but nicely, I think a lot of things are up towards the top end. Um, certainly learning out with an outcome seems to be fairly uncontroversial. People know uh, about that. Interesting to see that, uh, that people are saying that uh, learning outcomes, content and assessment are um, well aligned. I, that's the one that gives me pause because uh, Assessment on MOOCs is often quite restricted uh, in, in what you can do. And so particularly if you're thinking about more practical subjects, it's quite difficult to uh, assess those. Um, so for my context, I, I think I would be quite weak on that one. Um, and, uh, and I think other people are on the idea of activities being helping students construct their own learning probably not doing quite as well as we would like to on MOOCs. So there is a tendency to fall back into a sort of transmissive uh, form of teaching where you just give students stuff in the form of words or, or even video. Uh, relevant, accurate, and current, I would expect that to be high because MOOCs tend to have a, a rapid turnover. Um, but, so you wouldn't want them to be dated. Um, so I'm a bit surprised that that's not quite high. Uh, interactivity. A few there which are, are quite low, um, which again, I think it is an area that people are concerned about and, and make efforts. Um, but obviously, some people think there's a, more to be done. Um, and again, I'm probably a bit surprised that there isn't a mixture of formative and summative assessment. I think uh, I would take, assume that a lot of people would aim for that at, right at the beginning. So thank you very much for that. Uh, that's very interesting, and I think an, an interesting reflection. Uh, on what goes on. I'm going to go straight into actually another activity that's very similar, um, which again, thinking, so if we switch to the other whiteboard um, and do the same thing again. So think about the same MOOC that you just mentioned and just see if you can position it on these various um, aspects about openness to learners, digital openness, learner-centered approach, and so on. Um, I can see myself and I can't see anyone else's fingers. Uh, pencils working. Uh, Lizzie, have I done the right thing? 
Oh yeah, there we are. People starting to appear now. So, um, let me change my color. Well, getting some interesting responses there. I'll, I'll just leave it a minute to uh, so that people can uh, finish up. Well, very interesting. I think there's a much wider um, range of uh, of answers there that people have put in. So that's interesting to see that uh, how much it changes. Um, uh, let's see if there's any surprises in there. I I think openness to learners is, uh, is, I think generally MOOCs, they have no prerequisites, um, but often they are very, um, uh, have address a very specific area. So even though you may not need a formal prerequisite, you often need quite a lot of pre-existing knowledge in order to start the MOOC in the first place. And so maybe that's what uh, people are getting at when uh, they're reporting some rather low figures in there. Digital openness is an interesting one uh, because often uh, MOOC platforms uh, are open to users, but they are not freely licensed. So it isn't possible to take material and reuse it and so on. Um, so I think that is an issue. And again, that might be responsible for some of the um, variation there. Learner-centered approach, I think, is generally reasonably high. I can see one or two down at the bottom end there as well. Independent learning, you would expect to be high, I think, for, for most uh, or many MOOCs. But clearly, there are some which involve a lot of collaboration. And perhaps that's what uh, some of the, the ones that are on the other end of the scale uh, are. Media-supported interaction, I'm quite surprised that we've got some quite low ones there. because. Very typical of MOOCs is the use of video. Um, so I would have thought that that uh, would have rated rather higher. Recognition options, um, again, uh, it's again, in a way, I'm probably not surprised in that um, formal credit is, is not associated with MOOCs generally. And so uh, you can see that people would uh, um, tick near the bottom. Um, I think what open up ed means by recognition options isn't necessarily that um, that it would be formal ECTS credits or something like that, but at least there's some uh, way of recognizing it in a way that might be useful to an employer or for professional development or something. Uh, quality focus, uh, one would hope that would be high all the way through, but clearly not quite. Spectrum of diversity, I think, again, is an issue. I think. Uh, people do have some concerns about accessibility to disabled students specifically, um, but also that MOOCs are often um, don't support a huge flexibility in learning in different ways, different learning styles, and so on like that. So that, that's another aspect of diversity away from uh, accessibility. So uh, some several issues mixed in with that one. But a very interesting exercise. So uh, thank you very much for doing that. I think that's uh, that's that's interesting, giving me some food for thought there. So uh, let me move on then. Um, time is moving on. Uh, I'm going to go back to the slides. Oh, we've done that one. Done that one. Um, I just want to mention uh, a few more developments with Open Up Ed uh, because there are relatively few benchmarks, and then the responsibility is on um, needing to go and collect evidence and think about it a bit more. Um, there has been a move to uh, add some additional checklists uh, to up and open up ed uh, that will help people uh, in that um, endeavor. 
And so there are four extra checklists available on the website. Uh, one deals with the straightforward question, but is it a MOOC at all? Um, uh, and then there, there's another one about quality of design, one specifically focused on accessibility, which I've just mentioned, and another one about uh, which mixes in the technical platform and staff and participant uh, support. I'll just pick up some of the ones on um, design. Um, so there, again, um, you can rate yourself as not achieved, partially achieved, largely achieved, fully achieved. And uh, there are some rather more detailed, they're like indicators uh, that can be used uh, as part of a, a checklist. Um, and they've been collected together into subgroups um, like overall goal, learning objectives, and so on. And you can see that some of them actually do relate strongly to um, the benchmarks. Um, some of them have come from um, e-excellence directly. Some of them have come via uh, SCORE 2020, which is another project. And so the wording has come uh, from elsewhere. But they're all getting at uh, the same sorts of uh, areas. Um, there's a set here on learning activities. Um, and this one, I think was, there's some interesting things in there about um, about uh, the broad spectrum of participants' knowledge and skills, uh, which might be the issue that I, I mentioned when we're looking at the um, features just a, a minute ago. Let me just move on to uh, the last one I've got of these, uh, which uh, has aspects of feedback. And it's unpicking the different sorts of feedback that might be possible. And notice that here it's being really very much more specific and prescriptive about uh, what you could do than the benchmarks are. The benchmarks don't go into the detail about how you might actually do it. Um, but here it's saying a very specific thing about making a synthesis of artifacts from the previous week, for example. Well, um, that's a good and a bad thing. If you do that, fine, you've got a, a tick. But if you don't do it, then you're left wondering, uh, should I be doing it? Is it necessary to do it? Do I do achieve the same effect in a different way? Um, so there's always pluses and minuses with the, the level of detail. Um, and that will come up with the next uh, few slides as well. So I wanted to make reference to as mention of the quality reference framework for the quality of MOOCs, which is another EU project which was recently uh, published. Um, and there's material there on the web, uh, which takes a, a very thorough and uh, well-constructed reference framework, uh, and which I, I've started picking out some of the features there, includes the idea that while you're producing a MOOC, you go through different phases. So there's a time dimension to what you do, starting with analysis, moving to design, implementation, actually delivery of it, and then evaluating it at the end. And that there are different people involved who might be have roles like designer, facilitator, provider, and so on. Um, when you put that together, those three different dimensions, uh, it all gets really quite complicated. Um, so you can see just one aspect I've picked out, design, that's one of the phases. Um, and that's broken down into here 11 different processes, each of which has uh, different uh, roles there. Actually, in this particular example, the, the designer role is responsible for many of them because I picked design uh, as being appropriate for today. But if you pick one of the other ones, it tends to be a bit more mixed about who's responsible and who's involved with it. And you can see there are different um, perspectives involved with that. So as I say, it's beginning to get complicated. But then you need to take one of those processes and expand it. So I've just taken one of them, for example. And now you're getting into the criteria. And so here you have the more detailed criteria, again, broken down by who's involved and what perspectives they might have on it. Um, but you can see that there is quite a lot of uh, detail and material, which is both helpful in one way, but also worrying and constraining in another. Um, uh, all these things, of course, are helpful if you ask the right questions. And so there, there is effectively a parallel way of looking at it, which is in terms of uh, questions, uh, leading questions that you might ask about what you're doing to help you think through your design. And these are very helpful I mean, to ask about 
structure and, and so on, what sort of different media you're going to use. So they're important questions that you should be thinking about. Um, but of course, documenting and using it as an approach uh, where you actually have to document this then becomes a lot of work. Um, and so just to summarize uh, this as a whole, it has these five different phases, a number of different processes within each of those phases, and really a large number of criteria uh, there. So if you start using it as a documented process, um, it becomes really quite heavyweight. There's quite a lot to uh, think about and to record if you're going to do that. So um, which leads me to a final question. So uh, another poll, uh, which is um, uh, your preference. Uh, so uh, if you have a preference between the two extremes of picking up just a few generic benchmarks where then you have to go out and find evidence to, to support them, or having many detailed criteria where uh, at the end of the day, you're just really just ticking whether you've done it or not. Um, uh, wh where you think the best way of approaching uh, the whole business today might be. Um, I think it's an open question. I, I'm not sure um, what people want uh, out of the process. So I'd be interested to see people's reactions to that question. So please do uh, fill that in. Uh, so have we got some votes on that? Um, yeah, okay, that's interesting. So, um, uh, so I think the majority of them have picked. Uh, think it's it's more useful to to pick a few generic benchmarks sub, sub, supplemented by evidence, um, and I think that's where I've come from. From working on the since that, that is certainly the course that I've taken, thinking it's better to have the flexibility of allowing people to provide their own evidence uh, rather than constrain people to uh, detailed criteria. But when I do excellence reviews, I'm often confronted by people who are saying, actually, I want more detailed uh, criteria. So it's interesting to see uh, both of those in play. Well, thank you very much for that uh, response there. OK, I think I've done uh, really enough on um, the frameworks. But I did want to finish up, if you don't mind me carrying on for a, a, another five or maybe a little bit longer minutes, uh, just to talk about some more general issues of, of learning design. Again, with the theme of uh, design for MOOCs, uh, I think this is uh, an important aspect. and just um, to cover some parts of that. Um, so I think just to briefly ask uh, the question, what is learning design? It's um, something that's become, I think more people are conscious of it over the last few years. It's been around for well, maybe getting on for 10 years. Um, but it's at one level, it's a way of documenting uh, the design of a course. Um, but as soon as you do that, then that really helps you as a way of thinking about and discussing the design, actually really at an early stage. In other words, before you've gone to the trouble of creating the course, um, when often it's too late to change things. And so thinking about and documenting the design of the course helps to, ish to forefront issues um, much earlier and would help you, one hopes, in producing a good learning design for students. And inevitably, when we're talking about uh, e-learning particularly, um, nearly always discussions about design do turn into um, appropriate use of technology, and so, which is a very important part of e-learning generally, um, what technologies you use, how you use them, and so on. And so again, uh, the whole approach of learning design serves to forefront that in your design discussion. So it brings it up uh, early and uh, lets you talk about it. 
it also eventually gives you as a as a course or as a course designer um, a focus for evaluating your course because you may have taken decisions about what to do i'm going to use this particular technique uh, i won't do that one that gives you well actually was that a good decision did i make the right decision i want to find out how the students are reacting to it so having thought about your design it also gives you hooks for what you want to evaluate uh, at the end of it, which is very important if you're going to improve and do the quality enhancement for the next time. Institutionally, it also gives you uh, a way, uh, I think, and this will happen increasingly in future, of evaluating across course designs. So you can have courses which are designed in very different ways. And when an institution starts to gather information about that, it gives you a handle on what's a good way of teaching in general or teaching this specific subject, uh, which sort of courses do students like, which ones are they successful on, which are not necessarily the same thing, by the way. Um, so those are the reasons uh, behind learning design. I, the one I didn't put on there uh, is that it can be a, a bit of a stick to come and beat the academics with. You know, you said you would do this. And actually, what you did was rather different. Uh, so that's a sort of downside of it, that, that design can either be a straitjacket because you're held to it, even when you're in the middle of implementing, you think, actually, I should have done this differently, or that you change your mind, and then you have a design that doesn't match what you actually produce. So that there is a possible downside uh, to, to learning design. Anyway, some approaches. There are a number of uh, approaches out there which you can pick from. I'm just going to rattle through uh, three or four uh, quite briefly, but I think they're just worth mentioning. Um, uh, Gronje Connolly has done seven C's of learning design. Um, this has, uh, is a framework here, which is everything starts with a C. Um, so I think it's slightly, perhaps a little bit contrived, but basically it starts with an overall vision of what your course is, is about. Uh, activities which, um, sorry, I have to be careful here. There's, there's two levels at which things work here. A choice of what you want the students to do, that's student activities, and then uh, how you synthesize those, combine them so that to provide an experience for the student, and how you go on to uh, implement that. Um, that's what the whole learning design picture looks like. What's not visible there are lots of other activities which are for the module team or the course team that, that want to develop in the course to use to help them do the development. So, and I've listed a few of those that caught my eye. Um, things like a, a course tweet, trying to sum up uh, the course in, in, a, in a single tweet. Think about student personas, trying to think about the, who your students are. Uh, what they bring to the course, um, what their skills and backgrounds are, resource audit, what have I got, what can I use, what can I reuse from open educational resources and so on. Um, see where you sit on the spectrum between rather passive use by students, more active, uh, where they're having to construct things, where they're really interacting with each other. Um, that's a spectrum that's worth thinking about. Uh, constructive alignment I've mentioned a couple of times already. So these are important activities to help you as design activities. And then separately, you need to think about the student activities as well. There's a bit of confusion between the two meanings of activity there. Um, I'm going to uh, move to um, a tool, which is the Learning Designer, uh, which is based on quite strongly on Diana Lorelei's work uh, on conversational framework, where here we're talking about student activities and learning activities uh, where they're learning from one of these sort of six broad categories. Um, and the idea is that you uh, write a, a, in a detail about one particular activity, give it a time, how many people are involved, what sort of resources you need, um, and sketch out the activity um, and allocate it to these different categories. And once you've done that, you can begin to build up a picture of what a course or larger activities look like, the balance of different uh, learning activities that the students will be doing during it. So it's a very well documented uh, way of documenting your learning design. So it, it produces a good map of what you're intending to do. 
Um, and it is tool based, web based, uh, open to anyone. Just as a, a something that's a bit of a challenge to that, I, I've just picked this one, which is um, something which is a much more general idea about teaching and learning. So this is not e learning, it's certainly not MOOCs. This is a very general idea of learning. And the, the words on the left hand side there are the, the sorts of learning events that have been singled out as being important for learning. Um, the, the words on the right are really the teacher's role, and the left are what the student experiences. So student and teacher view. Um, but I, th I think it's worth putting those in because they're actually quite a challenge to do some of these uh, if you're doing it online and in MOOCs. Um, so just making you go back to more general educational context, um, I think could be really quite useful for us as designers to make us think a little bit outside the box make us be a bit more ambitious in the sorts of things that we offer to students. Um, anyway, so that's one. And another one which has, has been used uh, in the literature, which I'll mention but not go into detail, um, is one uh, that has been used in a, a MOOC paper as a sort of inventory of uh, existing MOOCs, which starts with some general um, characteristics, which are rather similar to the, the Lorillard ones. Um, and then has some additional ones uh, which are, are more specific to sort of practical um, implementations of those things. Um, I won't go into that in any more detail. What I will just mention now is, is um, an OU approach, which is actually derived from uh, work that Connolly, Connolly did at Winters at the OU a while ago, early days of learning design. It does seem to have aspects of the Lorillard model in there as well. But of course, with the OU, we've added our own stuff on, on top of it as well. So some of this is quite specific. Um, but I'm going to start with this idea that uh, of a module map. Now, I must make clear again, this, this is for all modules in the OU. Uh, and it's not for MOOCs. Um, so it actually excludes MOOCs at the moment completely. Uh, but it's for modules which are large things which may be e-learning, um, but may also be delivered in different ways. But um, it's a sort of overall picture. And again, it's to, to highlight at the top level of a module map, uh, it has all these wide features that we, we started with, these sort of holistic things. So guidance support, thinking about the library, assessment support, study support, and so on, um, which may not be appropriate to move, but it may also be. Um, the bottom left-hand panel is called reflection demonstration, but it includes all the assessment parts but also personal development and uh, reflection. So th these are actually important dimensions to think about uh, in any uh, course design. Um, bottom right, communication and collaboration, uh, you know, with tutor, with peers, with a wider community and so on. Uh, so that's what we might call social aspects to learning. And uh, top right um, is actually where you're getting down to the content. And in fact, the course study materials is only one of those three. So I, again, it's this view that um, you need to think about an awful lot of surrounding stuff as well as the actual course materials um, is an important uh, thing to take away from this. When you do get down to the course materials, then uh, we're starting to think about activity activities that you construct a course out of. And there's a load of icons along the bottom, which all represent different sorts of activities that you can pick and choose. And on the right hand side, there are sorts of uh, words that we use when you're talking about those activities, so things like read, watch, listen, and you can characterize those into uh, here we have seven classes. So read, watch, listen, they all are forms of simulation. Um, whereas if you ask your students to list or to analyze or to collate, then you're getting them uh, to do finding information, handling information. So any number of detailed activities you can probably fit into these uh, six or seven classes. I, I had some reservations about some of them, but, but generally I think they're, they're not a problem. Um, but once you do that, then we're on to the next stage, which is a planner. Again, you won't be able to read the detail, but it doesn't really matter. So what we have here is a table. Uh, the rows represent, in this case, weeks of the course, but it could be some other division. So it's parts of the course. And each column is those uh, categories that we've had. So the first one is assimilative, the next one's 
uh, finding handling information, next one's communication and so on. So what and what you fill in is how much time you want a student to spend doing that in that particular week. On the right hand side, it builds up a picture of how many hours the student is active during a particular week. And so you can see whether the workload is balanced uh, across the, the course and whether it's excessive at some particular times. And these are uh, should be warning signs because we know that workload is a, a very strong uh, determinant of student success. So that's an important aspect of what you do. If you add up the hours going down, then you, you're getting the total hours spent doing these different sorts of activities. And you see a bar shuffle along the bottom. And in this particular case, it does look a little bit out of balance. So we've got a lot of time spent doing similar activities, reading and writing, and sorry, uh, reading and watching and so on. Um, and actually very little, almost zero of communication, which is the third one there. So you might look at that and think, hmm, that doesn't look so good. Maybe I should change something. So this is a helpful uh, planner at an early stage to get a sense of what the overall balance of the course is like. Obviously, you need to start at this point having thought about what you're actually going to be teaching, when and how. So you need to be starting to build up the activities. Um, and so really, this should be an iterative process that's kind of done and expanded during the course. Actually, the OU it seems to be done big bang at the beginning. You're supposed to do it once at the beginning and then stick to it, which I think is completely unrealistic. And, and also, it has been used retrospectively to take an existing course and look back and map out uh, its design. I think the reality is it should be somewhere in between the two. Um, just to show um, an example, uh, here we have, again, the different categories similar to finding and handling information, communication, and so on. The blue and the gold show an early stage and a later stage. So uh, early was an early design. Then there was a workshop in which the module team got together and thought about their design and decided to make some changes. And that's reflected in the gold. And you can see the sorts of changes that were made. So for example, the assimilative category has been pulled down. And finding and handling information has gone up. Communication has gone up. So probably that's a reflection of the module team thinking, mm, this is all really quite passive on the behalf of the students. We want them to be more active in their learning. We need to change the activities to encourage them to do more uh, active learning, and we'll do that in these various ways. So you can see evidence here that the exercise of going through design and design workshops does actually make a difference to the design of a module really before it started to be produced. And uh, so at an early stage when it's still possible to make changes, seeing that pattern there has enabled the module team to make a change, uh, hopefully for the better. OK, I'm going to finish, uh, I think, at this point, uh, just with a quick summary. Um, I've, my kind of uh, position is that a quality framework should really underpin, underpin e-learning provision, uh, because that will, in the long run, help to create a quality culture. And that's more likely to produce quality e-learning and quality enhancement. And I think that's my kind of overall position for e-learning generally. And it applies to MOOCs as well. I don't think that, that MOOCs should be any different from that. Although, obviously, you don't want um, the overhead of too much formal process um, to get in the way of uh, creating something that should be relatively small and self-contained. Um, as to how to design the perfect MOOC, I have no answer. There is no simple recipe. What there is is a lot of diversity out there, uh, lots of opportunities to do things in different and innovative ways, which is great. Um, but I think the, the general things that do come out is that it really helps to work in a team uh, with different people to bounce ideas and to uh, get consensus and so on. It does help to think about learning design at an early stage, although it is quite hard work, I have to say. Um, and of course, we don't want the quality assurance procedures um, to get in the way of, of you know, what the day job is of producing good quality teaching. So you need to make sure that all of this is kept in proportion to 
uh, the effort that you put in, and it shouldn't be a burden or an overwhelming uh, aspect to what you do. But hopefully, it should just be built into your normal uh, way.